Hello, Mountain. It's good to see everybody. Glad you're here. I know I met some guests already on the way in, so really glad you're with us. Uh, Mountain's a great place. Glad you're with us today. We're in, we're in this uh, series of messages called Colors of Christmas, and it's really just giving us a, a way to, to look at this deal about how, what a difference it makes that, that God has sent His Son into the world, what, how different our lives and the world would be had He not come. Uh, but of course, He has come, and each color burst kind of allows us to think around a super significant concept. We started with red, the color of love, reminding us of the amazing love of God that comes to you and then is intended to flow through us to others. We last week talked about what color? White. White, the reminder that when a beautiful snowfall comes and covers a landscape with pristine beauty, it's the same thing we long for to happen in our lives. And it can through Christ because though your sins be as scarlet or ketchup, you can be white as snow. And this week, of course, the color blue, as we've already noted, and it does seem, as Rob had said a minute ago, a little odd for us to maybe think about blue as a color for Christmas, especially we're supposed to be having a good time, it's supposed to be a time of good cheer, uh, you know, making spirits bright. Clark Griswold says we're going to have the hap, hap, happiest Christmas ever right? And yet we're talking about blue. If you go uh, stroll the aisles at Walmart and fight the crowd, you will likely hear Andy Williams say, it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? And Burl Ives will chime in right behind him, have a holly jolly Christmas. And we get all this stuff, and the question is, is it really? Is it really? Is it really that way? Well, and the answer I think we know, and I love this church because we can always just be real and Acknowledge that it's not that way for a lot of people. For a lot of people, Christmas is a very difficult time. It's stressful. You know, you got to go to parties with people you don't like and get presents for people that you don't want to buy and can feel stressed and frazzled and being with wacky family members and all of that. So, so last, last week, if the song that was perfect was Bing Crosby's White Christmas this week, of course, the song that would be perfect would be what? Blue Christmas, sung by, most famously, Elvis. Come on, someone explain to the children who Elvis was. You know, uh, he, uh, he wore polyester, had big sideburns, and made the girls swoon and could really swivel his hips, and he was before Justin Bieber. There you go. That's kind of summary. So uh, would you like to sing it a little bit? Come on, you do, don't you? All right, do your best, Elvis. Let's sing it together. Here we go. Strike up the band. Come on now, get into it, let's go. Decorate. Come on. You don't want to see your pastor doing that. Be the same. They are not with me. So that's Blue Christmas. All right, so you get the idea. He says in there, he says, You'll have your Christmas of white, but I'll have a blue, 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 blue Christmas. And that's how you can feel sometimes that, that, you know, everyone else is having this great, awesome time and they're with family and it's just so perfect and all that, but I'm probably the only one who's feeling a little out of sorts right now or a little lonely or, or having a difficult time. And the, and the fact is, a lot of us can feel that way and it can be a pretty difficult time. I mean, for a lot of us. Well, for starters, for a lot of you, you've got the whole Ravens thing. I'm just saying, I'm just being honest with you, trying to pastor you a little. But seriously, there's so many reasons. You know, for a lot of people, you know, relationships get difficult this time of year. Maybe there's a divorce that's recent or maybe even a long time ago or a breakup um, that's kind of rocked your world. And you know, when romance or, or marriage or family dynamics aren't very good, Christmas just kind of brings all that to the surface, doesn't it? And makes it maybe even the sadness a little greater. Um, if your family isn't getting along, then the gatherings seem forced instead of fun. And who wants to do that? You know, when Home Alone is more than a movie title, but it's your Saturday night in this time of year, it, it can feel tough. Finances, I think, are an area that adds to some of the difficulty. We, we sometimes, a lot of us just have a little bit of margin, and then you want to be generous, but you're not able. When you're, when you're zipping and living on credit cards, increasing debt tends to decrease your joy, right? 
and, uh, and physically. I mean, it's tough physically. I mean, remember that year when all of us got fit and lost weight over the Christmas season? Yeah, me neither. So, you know, it's just, it's, it actually can add to the, to the stress as well as the waistline, right? Uh, you don't see people bringing a, a plate of steamed broccoli to, uh, to share at work. Uh, even though it's green, uh, we tend to have a tough time physically. Some friends were telling me how, how this year is going to be maybe extra stressful for them because their adult son is bipolar, and uh, he's chosen to not take his meds, and they all go into a tizzy when he does that because he goes into a tizzy, and he's like, he's like, why can't you take your meds? And he's like, why do you say that? And, and uh, it just is going to just feel stressful for them. Um, another said, pray for our family. We're falling apart at the seams. I think my grandson is on drugs, and it's tearing my son and his wife apart as they struggle with how to deal with that this year. There's a young military family who's stationed at APG here at this church, but they're new to the area. They don't hardly know anybody yet, and they can't get home for Christmas. So they're, they're thinking it's going to be a different kind of Christmas for them this year. And maybe you saw that a friend of ours in, in, here at North Hartford School, a 16-year-old girl d- diagnosed with leukemia this week. The world just keeps getting scarier in certain ways. There's a car accident in 95, took the life of someone near to a lot of people in this church. Officers shot in the face. Someone in our neighborhood with ISIS connections. All of a sudden, you know, from San Bernardino and Paris feel more threatening, you know. Maybe someone you love has passed away and you just miss them so doggone much, especially this time of year. In a little while after the bit, we'll sing Silent Night, Holy Night. But for a lot of us, the truth is our nights are neither silent or nor holy. And that phrase, all is calm, all is bright, is something like, I wish, you know, because it doesn't feel calm. It feels unrest. It feels kind of upsetting, and, and it feels dark. It was about exactly this time of year, December 16th, a long time ago, several years ago, when Rick Russo, my friend, was in his college dorm, and he got a phone call that his sister had been killed by a drunk driver. She was a high school senior and had just been in a friend's wedding that day and was at the reception on her way home when she was struck and killed. And so, you know, just a few days before Christmas, Rick and his family got together in a little church with a casket up front, and they had a funeral, and they sang um, her favorite song, Silent Night. And he'll tell you, you know, whenever he hears that song, to this day, you know, just that swell of emotion comes back and it, he goes back to that little church and that storm that he was in in those days and his life is great now you know he's got an amazing wife and and he's got these great kids and married these awesome people and great grandkids and it's a lot of joy and brightness in his life but just like a christmas tree that you unplug and all of a sudden it's dark he has a little bit of both going on too because of just the emotion connected to that. And I, I think we all identify with that, don't you? This idea that life is, is both beautiful and hard, both light and dark sometimes. We have heartaches and worries and pains and fear and grief. And I love the Bible because it's so utterly realistic and permits us to just deal with what is rather than put on a mask or you know, turn up the Christmas music and sort of act like we're supposed to be happy because joy, joy, joy. And one of the places that does that is we've been working out of Isaiah through this Advent series. Um, You remember Isaiah is is a prophetic word given like 700 years before Jesus ever visited the planet in person. And and God is speaking to people a lot like us who on the one hand want to walk with God and live in the light and yet who sometimes themselves are given to darkness and walking away from God. And in the midst of that, they, they find themselves in all kind of trouble. And so God gives them a prophetic word to kind of help guide them back to himself. And as a result, they start looking in all kinds of dark places. Isaiah chapter 8, they start looking in all kinds of dark places for help. It's not working and they find themselves in a very bad place. And so in the middle of this passage where God is speaking to his people, people like us, there was a phrase that just hit me like a ton of bricks this week. It's in chapter 8, verse, I think, 20. It says that they were at the place where they have no light of dawn. They they got to such a place they have no light of dawn. Think about that. When you're in a night that's so dark that you don't even have any promise that the sun's going to come up again. I mean, come on, you, you, no matter how dark it is, you always have the promise that the night is going to end and the day will come, right? Weeping only is supposed to last for a night, but joy comes in the morning, right? You know, the new mercies of God will be there tomorrow, right? But when you, sometimes you, you don't even feel that when you're in such a bad place. They didn't have that hope. Their relationship with God had been so ruptured. 
that they didn't have the promise of grace breaking through even the lightest little crack, something Jean-Paul Sartre might have called, you know, a dark room with no exit. No light of dawn on the horizon. Maybe, maybe you can identify with that from a period of your life or maybe even these very days where there's no there's such a dark depression that comes on you. You don't know how that blanket's ever going to get lifted. You can't see out of it. Or a sad situation that just seems to swallow you whole and it's like it's ended something permanently. Or horrible circumstances that seems like a night that would never end. For whom There's just no dawn. Listen to the next few verses. And listen to these words that jump off the page for us to show how the Bible is written for people who live lives like we do. Maybe someone will come to mind or your own heart will identify with words like these. Verse 21, distressed, weary, and hungry, they will roam from one place to another. And in their hunger, they'll be angry and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven, they'll look down at the earth, but wherever they look, there will be only trouble and anguish and dark despair as they live in utter darkness. Isn't that how it is? When you look and everywhere you look, it's bad. And you, you look up to God, you curse Him, you look at your friends and you're mad at everybody and everything and it's just dark everywhere. Whether it's because you're just strayed from God or you're harboring some sin or something happened to you or it's just the way the world feels to you or you're just flat. If there was music for this, if, 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 if the... If God were kind of putting an orchestra score for this, it would be dark and morose, wouldn't it? It'd be cellos and oboes kind of leading in minor keys to this sort of dark place. And then, as God always does, he brings this turn, this change in the midst of that. After we just acknowledge that's the way life is sometimes. Then this great word comes after, after God says, I know life is hard and you're feeling that way. Verse, the next verse is chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, well, that's a good hinge word right there. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. That's a good word for you today, my friend. The music changes to a hallelujah chorus of hope right there. Bam, all of a sudden we've got harps and pianos and violins and, and, the, and the light is cracking through on the horizon. Can you feel it? A promise, a, a thrill of hope, a dream that, that there can be another part of the story that you're experiencing right now, that the pain, the sorrow, the darkness, the blackness is not the last word. Can it be so? How can this be? Can it be, we say, and the prophet answers in the next verse, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, that's us, a light will shine. A light. A light. What is it? Can you see it? What is it? Verse 6 answers it. For us, a child is born, a son is given. What kind of son? Well, the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be, you, you say these names with me together, shall we? He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. The New Testament writers would look back and they'd look at Jesus, they'd look at that, they'd look at Jesus, they'd go, that's him, that's him. He is the Messiah. For unto you this day is born a Savior who is Christ, the Messiah, the one of whom Isaiah spoke. And John would say, in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all people, and the darkness will not overcome it. Jesus knows about darkness, even as he's the light. He came in darkness. The sheep herders were doing the night watch. The wise men followed a star. Jesus came in the dark. He knows about darkness. Herod led in a dark time. There were massacres in those days too. Roman oppression, poverty, violence. It was dark and Jesus comes to say to people like us who walk in darkness, there's light coming. And it is I. It is Jesus. When I was a kid, we lived in Minneapolis for a while and I had a room to myself. It was just a little sewing room with a slanted, uh, you couldn't have stood up in it, and a little cot in it, so I don't want you to think it was nice to have my own room or anything. But it was at the end of the long, dark hall, and I remember saying as a kindergartner to my, to my brother or my mom, whoever I could talk into it, would you go with me and turn on my light? Because I didn't want to walk that hall alone. What did I want? I wanted someone to be with me to get to where we could turn on the light. And friends, that's what God has given us in Jesus Christ, someone to be with us and to bring light into our darkness. 
as the same prophet Isaiah would say in chapter 7, right? It, it, it will be a virgin. A sign will come, and the virgin will conceive a child and she'll give birth. And what will she call him? You tell me, Emmanuel. Now, some of you are like, well, what does that mean? Well, the Bible tells you. It means God with us. Someone with us and to bring us light, which means this Christmas, friends, the presence of God is a way bigger deal than the presence under the tree, right? And so God is with us to bring light. So what difference does that make? Well, here's how it can make a difference for you. Let's start getting practical here. The brother of Jesus, you know, he wasn't an only child. The brother of Jesus, James, has a whole book attributed to his name in the New Testament. In chapter 4, verse 8, he says something really important. Here's what it is. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. As God has sent Jesus Emmanuel to be with us, to be light in your life that is effective and sort of happens as you, through faith and hope and trust, allow yourself to draw near to God. Will you draw near to Jesus? Because that wonderful list of things that's mentioned in Scripture, He's meant to be all of that in your life. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I hope you'll draw near to Jesus this Christmas, and He can and will be all of those things in your life, because we need all of those things. Let's look at them one at a time, and you do some real thinking about how you'll draw near to Jesus this, this Christmas. First of all, I hope you'll draw near to Jesus because He can be your wonderful Counselor. Your wonderful counselor. Wouldn't it be awesome to have a 50-minute session with Jesus every week? Well, you can. You know that, right? You know, this idea of counselor just means trusted advisor, someone who, who will be by your side to guide and advise, to direct and help you with decisions, to help you figure out what you ought to do. Who doesn't need that? I wonder if you'll allow, will you allow Jesus Christ to be your counselor, your trusted personal advisor in all things that really matter 24-7, will you? When I think of Jesus as wonderful counselor, I'm reminded of this painting by Harry Anderson. It's called Divine Counselor. I have it in my office at home. I picked it up because I love it. I, I, it's Jesus sitting there in a high rise, some you know, apartment or, or, or office, that maybe New York City, that guy's important. He's a politician. He's a lawyer. He's a, is he a physician? Is he, is he, a, is he a, 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 some kind of business mogul? I don't know, but he's listening intently with a quizzical look because he's invited Jesus there, and it's as if he has said, what do you think, Jesus? Talk to me about my life. And that's the moment that the painting captures. I love it. I got it when I came because I thought, well, as a young preacher, what do I have to say to these people? But I know, Jesus, you can be their counselor because you have so much to say. I've known people that pray with an empty chair next to them just so that helps them visualize Jesus really just being there. So as they open their word and they're hearing from God in Scripture and they're praying, they're saying, Jesus, talk to me. Be my wonderful counselor today. Whose voice are you listening to? Everybody's listening to some voice, right? You're making your decisions, you're leading your life based on something. So who's, whose voice are you listening to, you know? The news? Fox, CNN, NPR? Is that gonna, you're going you're, you're, you're to Google your life? You're going to Facebook your life to find out what you need to do? Social media, our way to our destiny? TV, social media, the news, whatever? When we've got personal decisions to make, what we need to say is, Jesus, I'm going to turn my face toward you and you're going to be my wonderful counselor. Let's be honest. I'm going to say this gently, but a lot of us know this needs to be said. The reason some of us are blue and having a difficult time in our life is precisely because we didn't do this. We didn't listen to God. We went our own way. Then we came in on the back end. We want him to fix it or bless it. And it's not always easy to start out even for God that way. It's about... There's a turn in every one of these titles, a turn that has to happen for us to really draw near to Jesus. And the turn here, I would say, is this. We need to turn our face toward Jesus. He can't be your wonderful counselor if you're turning the other way. 
You know, I love what 2 Chronicles 30, verse 8 says, don't be stiff-necked as your fathers were. Submit to the Lord. We think of a stiff neck as something you get when you sleep funny on a pillow, but it, it, it was a symbol for being, you know, I'm not going to look at you, God. I'm going to do my own thing like a stubborn little kid when mom was trying to turn that face like, nope, I'm not doing it. And that's how we are with God. Jeremiah 17 says, yet they did not listen or incline their ears, but they stiffened their necks in order not to take correction. We don't want to turn our head. We don't want to bow our head in submission. What we need to do is turn our face toward the wonderful counselor. As Hebrews 12 says, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. And it would be a mistake not to get the good counsel of Jesus who has your best interest at heart to seek him out, whether it's career, finances, fellowship, relationship, financial stuff. The same James who said, draw near to God, is the James who said, if you need wisdom, ask for it. And you have a wonderful counselor. Is that a good word for you this year? Turn your face toward Jesus. Turn your face toward Jesus. Because he's your wonderful counselor. But may you draw near to Jesus also because he is mighty God. Mighty God. That little baby grew up to express the fullness of God's amazing power coursing through his life. Amazing. To quote Disney's genie, Aladdin, immense universal power, itty-bitty living space. And that's what happened with Jesus. And people were drawn to Jesus that way, right? They came to him, and their sickness was met by the power of God. Disease, spiritual oppression, people sought out Jesus and he brought mighty God power to bear on it. Demonic oppression, spiritual confusion, you know, all kinds of restlessness, loneliness, alienation from leprosy to loneliness. Jesus healed it and friend, that same power is in Jesus today. Draw near to that Jesus. He is mighty God. He wants to be mighty God in our lives in a real way. Not words on a page from 700 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 1,700 years ago. So let's get practical. One of, the, one of the turns that has to happen here for mighty God to come to bear in your life is, is through prayer. We talk a lot about this, but what we need to do is turn our worry into prayer. Worry is the inner dialogue where I talk to myself. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What's going to happen? What am I going to do? When we turn that inner dialogue to dialogue with you and God, now it's a conversation, and instead of what am I going to do, you say, God, I need you to do what only you can do. I need you to do what only you can do. God, will you please do that? Philippians 4 says it this way. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Don't worry about everything. Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Turn your worry into prayer. I wonder if some of the things that we're most stressed and blue about this Christmas are things that we feel the, reason, the way we do is because we've done everything we know to do and it hadn't gotten any better. Well, perfect. There's an opportunity for you to turn your worry into prayer and submit some things to God. Is there something that you need to release to God through prayer as you draw near to God in a humble dependence and a need to say, I can't do anything. God, maybe you will. I know you're mighty. And you approach him in the same way people did in Jesus' own day. Draw near to Jesus. Draw near to Jesus, my friend. And you'll connect with a wonderful counselor as you turn your face to him. You'll have the power of mighty God unleashed in our world, in your life, in powerful ways as you turn from worry to prayer. And draw near to Jesus because he is everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Now this... You might think, well, that's confusing. I thought he was the son, you know. How is he both? Well, I think it's referring to the fact that Jesus and the Father are one. He connects us to our Heavenly Father, but also the word Father is really a descriptive phrase being used to talk about Messiah, and the word Father is meant to say he's the one who, pro who will provide for you. He'll take care of you. You don't need to worry. You don't need to be afraid. Father is here. He'll protect you. He'll provide, not like a sugar daddy. He'll, but he'll give you what you need, and he, he knows better than we do even. Some of this is maybe really relevant as you think this Christmas about your earthly father. I mean, for some of us, your father was a disappointment, or he was not there, or he was non-existent, or he was absent, or emotionally cold, or you've lost him and miss him so much. Whatever the case, Jesus, friends, as you draw near to Jesus, you're drawing near to one who will never leave or forsake you. He's your father who will never leave or forsake you. 
So draw near to that Jesus. That's a gift. That's a beautiful strength that we all need in our lives, whether or not you got any of that from an earthly father. And that kind of father just helps us know, I'm going to take care of you. All the fear that we sense in the air can be brought into proper perspective when father is there. You know, I think this last week, it showed for the 50th year in a row, the uh, Peanuts, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas or whatever it's called. I love that because in a day and age when there's so much, you know, change and social media stuff and trends that don't, you know, last any longer than a week, anything that lasts 50 years is a pretty big deal. I mean, other than Mick Jagger, it's just, we, got, we, got, we got Charlie Brown Christmas. So that's pretty impressive. And you probably know that story, right? You know, they're getting all upset and they're trying to have the Christmas pageant. And Charlie Brown says in his little puny voice, doesn't anybody know what Christmas is all about? And who steps up? Linus does. And when you see Linus, what does he always have over his shoulder? His blanket. Go ahead and show that picture of Linus. He's a smart little guy, but he's a little insecure. He's like some of you. He's like some of me. And I love that blanket. It's always part of who he is. Somebody pointed out something to me I'd never noticed before, that there's a moment in that story where something dramatic happens. He steps up and he begins to say, in the days of Caesar Augustus, a decree went out that all the world should be taxed. He quotes the whole story, tells of the birth of Jesus. And then he gets to the part about the angelic announcement when the angels come to the shepherds and Linus drops his blanket. It's the only time it's ever happened in any, any of the Charles Schultz cartoons, ever. He drops his blanket. Do you know the exact moment he dropped that blanket? When he announces the words, fear not. You can't tell me that's an accident. Charles Schultz was way too smart. A beautiful symbol and a power to show us this security blanket, this thing that we think is going to make us okay. Jesus comes and it separates us from our fears. Jesus comes and it changes everything. The, the blankets that we have, that we think are going to hold us and take care of us, even those we can drop at the angel. That angel announcement, friends, is for us to, today in the city of David. So fear not, y'all. I wonder what blanket you have that you need to drop if you really just accepted Jesus and his Father as your Father. What blanket of fear? What, what false security are you propping yourself up with? Because you, you've got your income, you've got your kids, you're going to have a nice little perfect Christmas and be all right. You know, but you know if all that went away, you'd be a mess. What fear is holding you back from worshiping in full allegiance and from living a life that God's calling you to? What blanket do you need to drop? You know, he takes that blanket and then he places it around that little Christmas tree Maybe a symbol of how we need to take our fears and leave them at the foot of the cross. What fear would you be the better for if you left it behind? Because you have a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, everlasting, never going away in your life. Draw near. Draw near. We need to turn. We need to turn from our fear to Father. Wonderful counselor turns our face to Jesus. Mighty God turns our worry into prayer. Everlasting Father turns our fear to faith. And, and lastly, I encourage you to draw near to Jesus because he's our Prince of Peace. God knows we need peace, right? Our Prince of Peace. You know, the word prince doesn't mean like next in line or almost king like Harry or William. It, it means just chief, principal, first. And peace, there isn't the absence of conflict. It's that deep well of a word that keeps gushing meaning into our lives. Shalom. Shalom. The, the sense of wholeness and goodness. The way our lives and the world will be and would be if all were the way they're supposed to be. When Messiah comes, he brings shalom. On earth, peace and goodwill among people where God's favor rests. The turn that needs to happen here, my friends, for peace to really come into our lives is the turn from emptiness to fullness in Christ. To fullness in Christ. So many are empty. 
even some people who dress up and go to church, there's an empty gnawingness. And you know what? The gnawing hole inside is a gift from God, my friend, to draw you back to the one thing that can ultimately fill us, and that's Jesus. You know, some interpreters and translators will say that that word Messiah, Christ, is the same word, that one way to understand that word is to translate it this way. Messiah is the one who will fill you up. Isn't that beautiful? We're empty. We're hurting. There's holes in our lives and our hearts. God, will you fill us? Will you fill us? And the Bible says, I can fill you with this fullness of Christ. Draw near to that kind of God. Firefighters um, pulled Sapphire's body from the ashes. She was covered by her father who was killed in the flames. She was still alive. It was a couple years ago, an arsonist set fire to um, the family's apartment stairwell in Schenectady, New York, and she was five years old. She lost her father, her younger sister, and two younger brothers in the blaze. Here's a picture of Sapphire. She was severely burned all over the majority of her body. She lost the skin on her face and her left foot, her entire right hand, and had to have parts of her body amputated later. And they just left her to sort of pass away in peace, tried to make her as comfortable as they could. But she's a spunky little girl. She's, she wanted to live, and she did live, and she's now eight years old, and she's got an amazing smile and a great laugh and an undefeatable attitude, and her aunt, to me, actually seems like a pretty impressive person as well. You can go see YouTube videos of this little girl. But something happened um, a couple weeks ago. Sapphire uh, and her aunt were preparing to celebrate Christmas, and she just loves Christmas, loves Christmas. And her aunt went and bought at Goodwill a Christmas card tree, you know, that holds all the, tree, the, the cards, and um, yeah, I think you can see it there in the picture, and she helped put it up there, the two of them, and she got so excited, and, and she declared, I can't wait to fill it up with cards. Well, her aunt wanted to bring her down gently and just said, honey, I don't think we're going to end up filling up that whole tree, but we'll probably have a few cards that came in, and a few cards came in, they put a couple in. Well, she thought, I better help here, so she put something on Facebook and said, here's, here's my here's Sapphire, will you, will you help? And so they got like 50 cards, and they started filling that card tree up. She's so happy. Well, someone got a hold of it put it on social media. It's been on Imgur and social media. It's been all over the place. This week, on one day, they received over 150,000 pieces of mail for this little girl, these cards. And they're like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So, so 150,000 pieces of mail. I will fill you up. It way exceeded their expectations. There are things in life you look at, you think, it's, it's beyond wisdom to hope that that could ever happen, that we could ever feel like that, that this would come about, that that kind of healing and wholeness could actually happen. And the Bible says there's one who's coming and his name is Jesus and he is the one who can fill you up beyond your wildest hope or dreams, beyond what we would ask or imagine through the mighty power and goodness and graciousness of God. Luke 2, 11, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you and he is, what's the word? Christ. That's the word Messiah. He is the one who can fill us up, no matter how empty, sad, dark, alone, dismal we ever feel. That's what peace is. That's shalom. That's Jesus. Philippians 4, 7 would echo that and say, that's the shalom of God. And not everyone's going to understand it. You won't even understand it. It'll transcend understanding. In other words, it won't make sense. Your life could still be really stinky, and yet you've got this peace. It can still be dark, and yet there's this light of hope in it. And it's like other people won't even understand it sometimes. You'll say, I I don't understand it. Here by this neonatal bed, I I still have peace, the Wells family will tell you from this last year, somehow. And it's a matter of trust in a good God who didn't leave us in the dark. And so back to Isaiah 8, where we started in the midst of all that darkness and fear, verse 17 is the, is the statement of faith for all of us. It says, I will wait for the Lord, who seems to be hiding his face from us, but I will put my trust in him anyway. And some of us need to do that exact thing right now, this year, in the midst of our blue Christmas. Or Isaiah 50, verse 10 says it this way, let the one who walks in the dark, and it may be you, who has no light, that may describe things for you, Let that one trust in the name of the Lord and rely on God. 
When you're in bankruptcy court, after a messy breakup, when your boss calls and hands you a pink slip, it's going to be a blue Christmas. But friends, all of those things remind us that it's not the end of the story. Even Jesus himself, after a, a bloody Friday, was thrown into a dark tomb with the door closed tight. But that wasn't the end of the story because even there God broke light into it as he will in our lives. And so draw near to Jesus as your wonderful counselor. Turn, turn your face toward him and turn your worry to prayer as your mighty God, Jesus, draws near to you. And as your everlasting Father comes to you as you turn to him, turn away from your fear to Father. It's a beautiful thing, and I hope that you will, as your Prince of Peace. We want to close this special time with a moment of remembrance and prayer. We've lit some candles that you can see here today, um, and we wanted those to kind of represent people who are part of this church or people who are important to us uh, who have died in 2015. They represent the lives of some parents and grandparents. They represent the lives of siblings and friends and some children. Some who didn't make it to birth. Some who lived only a short time. Others who lived good long lives and others in between. Some, who, some died after an illness, some uh, after a sudden accident or disease. One, at least, represents a soldier killed in the line of duty. A few others are lit for someone who, in a moment of depression, ended their own life. They represent moms and wives and husbands and fathers and daughters and sons and friends and loved ones. And, and each one is important to you, to us as a community, and to God who is with us, Emmanuel. It's a reminder that we're not alone as we do this together. These are things we worry privately about in our silent, unholy nights. And now we bring together... And we say we're not alone. Jesus is here, our everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and we're together in this moment and looking back over the names of those people from Mountain and in our lives. I saw so many friends and loved ones, many of them populating and celebrating the halls of heaven now. Names that I invite you to call to your mind right now. So if you're a person who's had someone that you love die this year, someone close to you passed away in 2015, you don't have to do this, but I'm inviting you to. I'm going to invite you to stand right now because we'd, we'd be honored to pray with you and for you and your family. So if you have a relative or someone close to you that you care about who died in 2015, I'm inviting you to stand right now. If you'll just go ahead and stand up, humble yourself and do that. There's a second group I'd like to invite to stand as well. Maybe you lost someone dear to you, but it wasn't 2015. It was um, maybe a long time ago, but you still feel that loss very deeply. And at Christmas, you particularly feel it in a keen way. And maybe you're even embarrassed that you still feel it as deeply as you do, but you do. I'm just going to invite you to stand as well. Someone that is close to you died, and they're not with us anymore, and you would welcome prayer for you. This is an important and appropriate time for you to stand may take a bit of courage, but this is a safe place to do it and to admit to the Lord that we need Him. So I'd like you just to kind of look around briefly because in a moment I'm going to have everyone stand. And what I'd like you to do is something that is a biblical thing and a mountain thing that we do quite frequently around here. And, I, and I'm just going to ask, if you're near one of those people, would you make sure that everyone who's standing has at least one hand gently just kind of in a non-invasive way placed on their shoulder or their elbow um, so they could, by extension, feel the touch of God. Would you do that now? You might have to move to do that, but let's move, and especially if there's a whole bunch that, that don't have anyone near them, will you just all stand, find those who are standing, and maybe it just means we'll just have one big group hug. I don't know how that works, but just let's extend the love and grace of God, and let's go to Him in prayer. Father, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we are living in a land with darkness. And we long to see the great light. And we praise and thank you for sending Jesus who brings hope 
beyond the grave and hope in the midst of our darkness. And we pray that you will give us your peace. We lift up our eyes to the hills, Lord, and there you are. Oh, thank you for being there. Our help comes from you. So we pray for those whose hearts are hurting because of losing someone. We pray that they would know in a special way, Emmanuel, that you would be with them, not words on a page, God, but that you would be the word living in us, near us, as we draw near to you in moments like these. And by your Holy Spirit, God, will you help fill the hole in our hearts left by these absences? For those who ache, will you bring healing? Will you help us to heal and move into the future for the purpose that you have for those of us who are still alive? For the sorrow of people we love who are now gone and for the sorrow of people that we couldn't stand and for now we feel guilty and confused about that, will you help us with all of that? Most of all, we thank you for the hope we have that in Jesus, knowing our lives can be spent forever with you when we trust in the Savior, Jesus, who is Christ the Lord. So we pray through the darkness and in the midst of whatever sadness is here that's real, that what would be more real is the joy the angels sang about. Good news of great joy for all people. Lord, let it be for us right now, even in the midst of our tears. Bring us joy in Jesus, O God. By your tender mercy, guide our feet into the path of peace. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. You can remain standing. <clears throat>